Hello, my name is Laura Terrell, and I had the pleasure of presenting this session um, previously on a Saturday in October, and I wanted to re-record it to make it available for other teachers or for some to possibly revisit. Um, for those of you that do not know me, I am a former French teacher. I taught French K-12 for 21 years and then moved into supervision of English as a Second Language and World Language programs. I have taught methods courses at different universities. I've also been on the board of state organizations, central states, and ACPO. I wrote Keys to Planning for Learning, um, Effective Curriculum Unit and Lesson Design with my colleague, Donna Clementi. And I've had the pleasure of working with Star Talk programs, um, not in Tamil, but in Hindi and Urdu um, over about 14 years. So. That is probably why I am joining you today. And I also collaborated on the new sixth grade curriculum units. And so have a little bit of familiarity with those. If you're joining me today, this is basically what we're hoping to accomplish. You have your goals provided by your textbook, but how will you select images and video that are in support of your unit goals? and working with those images and videos in order to increase student engagement in your classrooms. And then finally, being very intentional about selecting strategies that address each mode of communication in ways that allow for different students to demonstrate what they are able to do. And in order to facilitate um, your progress through this session, I did prepare a guide that will allow you to follow along or possibly take some notes on um, the slides that you see. And you can find it either by using the QR code or by typing in um, that long URL, apologies for that. But um, this was also sent to the participants in the Saturday workshop. So when we think about um, the importance of using visuals, and I like to focus here because it really is something that is easy to do. It doesn't require a lot of extra work on the part of a very busy teacher, but our brains process images more readily than print. And so when we add visuals to our lessons, it's a very powerful teaching tool because it actually enhances memory. And we have some research from Columbia University that suggests that it could be as much as um, retention moving from 14% of what we've done to 38%. And so if just adding a visual that any type of text that has visual to my lesson is going to be that significant in increasing retention, it is something that's worth doing. And it's that old adage that a picture may not be worth a thousand words, but boy, that picture may really help um, in this case with comprehension and with memory retention. So when you sit back and you think about a picture and you look at that, you're really seeing, as Sandra Savignon says, culture in motion. So I could talk about the words table and chair and coffee and cigarettes and dog, but that's just language. But when I put the image with those words, I am seeing something that I could not perceive of without that image. And so when we're thinking about images first, what images are we talking about the text that's any image. So it could be a work of art, it can be a picture, the jacket of a book, an ad, an infographic, a website, but anything that allows our eyes to extract meaning. And then what Janelle Moran reminds us is that our ability to read the visual aspects of our surroundings means that we're visually literate. We can interpret what we're seeing and we interpret them, most importantly, as those who are in the environment, in that culture would interpret them. And so I don't judge this image from my American perspective, which says there should not be a dog sitting 
at a cafe table. Instead, I am curious and I'm thinking, okay, this is obviously something that is supported in the French culture. And I wonder why, and what does this say about our culture, their culture? What can we infer? So it's, it's a way to appreciate what we're seeing without judging it. We're stepping in, we're analyzing it, we're looking at what is going on in this picture? And we're no longer just learning words, we're, we're learning the cultural implications of those words. Visuals in terms of the science of learning, they create novelty in the brain. So they immediately open the brain to better learning experiences. And so they do this in a way that text just can't. And one of the reasons is that it's an immediate release of dopamine, which is that chemical that makes us happy, but it also serves to stimulate the memory centers of the brain. So a good visual almost ensures a connection to memory. And so what visuals? Well, when you look at this one, drawn from a French newspaper, online newspaper for middle school students, you have to look at it and think, what in the world is going on? You just, your brain cannot see this horse in a hospital room without beginning to think about the questions. The what, the why, where in the heck is this? When is this happening? Who arranged this? What is going on? And that stimulation of curiosity also provokes that release of chemical. It's that dopamine again, I want my answers, I'm curious. And that dopamine functions like candy or ice cream or even heroin. It's that same feel good chemical that enhances memory. So we're trying to find ways that when our learners walk into the class, they're tired, they don't wanna be there, that we can turn a switch in their brain as quickly and efficiently as possible. And it is the visual that does that. By sharing just the visual and generating that curiosity, I can pretty much guarantee that now when I have my learning goal explaining how animals help people, that they're gonna want to read and understand the text in order to know more about why this horse is in the hospital. And so, the, the article for um, just for your curiosity now uh, is that this is a retired dressage horse and, um, you know, he's 16 years old. And so he goes in like a service animal and brings cheer to people that are really sick in the hospital in Calais in the north of France. The second trait in the brain that will provoke this opening of the door is when we trigger emotion. And Parker Palmer um, says it best, intellect works in concert with feelings. So if I hope to open my students' minds, I have to open their emotions as well. And so it's hard not to react to this picture of a sleepy child in a suitcase being carried by a man and wonder why and where and what is going on. And so it's that same feeling, I really do want to understand what is being said here. So in the context of my goal, I can tell the story of a refugee, then I want to be able to know what is going on here and why is this child in danger? And so it was working with the picture first and saying what we could about it making predictions and asking questions that now makes me as a learner want to confirm what I thought and what um, answer the questions that I legitimately had. Far more purposeful than, oh, let's read this and now here are the questions I wrote and you write the answers. You took away um, their own curiosity about what was going on. Both of those examples used authentic resources. And while it's very hard to rely on a textbook to give you authentic resources, it is very helpful to be able to take the context of what you're teaching and find something authentic from the target language to meal to go with it. 
So you're thinking, well, this is real world. It showed up in a newspaper. It's obviously cultural. I don't exactly understand what's going on here. And more importantly, it's models of corrupt language. And so as language changes over time, um, we're keeping current with our own language and what is happening currently. And so I am hoping that I'm finding these images in these texts that are meaningful and they have a message that students really do want and need to understand. And so that's something that authentic text can do for us, authentic images can do for us. And then you have the translation on this slide. And what it basically means, if any of you have young children who are screaming a lot, it's just a sign in this culture that that child is extremely healthy. So when they're waking you up in the middle of the night, you know they're healthy. The same could just be the images. And so, yes, I can show my clip art image to aid in comprehension, but it's a missed opportunity if I don't have the authentic image from the culture to show as well. And so it isn't the clip art image that makes me curious or provokes emotion, but being told that this is a high school yeah, I'd like to read about that because this does not match my image of a high school in any culture that I've ever experienced. Certainly didn't look like the one I went to, actually the four that I went to. So I am going to be drawing examples um, today from Project Zero, from the Thinking Routine Toolbox, primarily from this one, um, exploring art images and objects. But this is an excellent resource, online resource, that has lots of different teaching strategies where you can click, you can see them, you can get some examples. And so if ever you're bored with your routines and you're looking for something new and different, excellent website to reference. And today we're gonna to be looking at that artful thinking palette and looking at thinking routines that are often associated with looking at visuals, what we get out of them. And so we'll take each of these and I'll give an example. And then I will be asking you to think about how would I use them in my own classes? What could I be doing next week? So the first one that's on that list, questioning and investigating, it's already been suggested in some ways by seeing the picture with the horse or the child in the suitcase. What do you see? What do you think about what you see? What do you wonder? And so it is a routine because you would first start with the literal. What is in that picture? People, dogs, ruins, cameras, phones. What do you really see? Then what do you think about it? You know, can you express your own opinions? Um, I can't imagine what's going on here. Why do we have all of these dogs? And why do people want pictures of all of these dogs? What is the event? And then what questions do I have, like I was just suggesting? And what this does, it really lets students distinguish between what they observe and what they're theorizing, what they're thinking, because that might be wrong, but it's stimulating curiosity and letting them make connections to their own lives. I love dogs, I go to dog shows too. And so you're just simply going through that see, think, wonder routine. All of these are routines in the sense that you're using a strategy and you want to use the strategy in other contexts frequently so that it becomes a way of thinking in the brain. When I see that dog in a cafe, I'm thinking, what do I see? What do I think? What do I wonder? And I'm just training my brain to process images. I'm gonna pause for a little bit longer and turn that into a direct instructional task, then ask your students to write the questions that they have. And that's a hierarchy of questions. So depending on where they are on the proficiency continuum, they might just be saying, are those dogs or cats? Um, which do you prefer, a dog or a cat? Where are they? What are they doing? Why are they taking pictures? writing as many questions as they can. And that's a critical language piece for us 
because that ability to write their own questions moves them from novice high to intermediate low. And we know that all too often in the classroom setting, it's the teacher that's asking all the questions. And so it's very important that we turn questioning over to our students as often as possible. A second strategy coming from that artful uh, thinking palette is this idea of observing and describing, but in a specific way. So this is um, called beginning, middle, end. And it's basically, well, here's a work of art and hopefully I chose an appropriate one. And I'm looking at it. I'm gonna be able to say what's happening, who's in the image, but it is the idea that I'm building a story with this. I'm really thinking more deeply about elaboration and extension of ideas. And this is critically important because it's getting us to, from intermediate low to mid isolated sentences to a complete context of a paragraph by looking for those connections, those meanings. And so basically it's also a grammar activity. Um, I know that in sixth grade that there is an intentionality about teaching time frames. Well, it's very, very hard to teach time frames in a drill and kill fashion, like write the correct form of the verb. Because what happens is when the students are doing that, they get it right. But when they start to do their own writing, it falls apart because they really don't understand the concept of time because that's something that when we grow up in a language, we just manipulate it without analyzing the time frame. We know that we do it because it sounds right. So you're asking them to say, well, what happened yesterday? What happened before this picture was taken? And what is happening in this picture and what is going to happen or what will happen in the future? And so when you, you can pick up multiple images and apply this same sequencing and you're always working with time frame rather than it being this this unit it's time to work on this tense it just is a natural way of approaching it and just so you know that for actual proficiency purposes whether a student says what is going to happen or actually says what will happen they both count as future time frames so they would get full credit for being able to express themselves in the future, no matter which way they approach that. Here's a simpler example that I added, because I realized we had some um, elementary teachers in the group, but it can be anything, a picture of anything. What happened yesterday when you were visiting this place? What is happening? What is going to happen? And it could be as simple as the same verb. So let's say we're going to do hike. Well, yesterday I hiked in the rainforest and today I'm hiking in the rainforest again. And tomorrow I'm going to hike in the rainforest forest, or they could change their verbs. Yesterday I hiked in the rainforest. Today I am swimming in the rainforest and tomorrow I am going to um, climb to the top of the rainforest. So it could be different verbs or the same verb, both allow them to practice time frames. It's possible that we have a topic that is just not interesting. Um, in sixth grade, we've decided, you know, we're gonna do a reading about clothing. Well, you know, some people in those teen years, preteen years are really into clothing and some could care less. It's just like, wake up, roll out of bed, put clothes on, go to school. And I don't really care what I wear, you know, so getting kids to talk about clothing for some, it's absolutely going to be of interest and for others not. So when we find a topic like that, we might need to look for a way to make that topic a bit more complex. And so, you know, I was just trying to think about what would make this topic more complex. So I went and looked for some uniform pictures and hopefully I chose appropriate language ones. Always a risk when I don't understand the language. But so let's look at this topic, you know, and so obviously we're going to be breaking it down into what are the parts of the topic? Who wears uniforms? Should we wear uniforms? So you're looking at those different aspects of the topic. Um, do we wear we're uni uniforms? What are the advantages? What are the disadvantages? Should we, shouldn't we? 
Um, do you like the uniform? Uh, what don't you like about the uniform? What color uniforms do you prefer? Trying to take and find a way to talk about clothing in a way that makes it more complex in an effort to make it more cognitively engaging so that they will want to work with that language and vocabulary. Viewpoints, we all have our viewpoints on everything and we do not look at things in the same way. And so this is basically the idea that I can look at that picture. It's like the picture of the dog in the cafe. I can look at it with my American brain and I can say, danger, danger, danger. I probably shouldn't have even said American brain. I'm just gonna look at it with my mom brain and say, whoa, um, I'm not liking this at all. Uh, but, you know, it's being done. It's obviously considered to be okay in this culture to do this. This image is bringing things to life and we can start to talk about it from the perspective of the person in the picture. And actually, the more you know about the person in the picture, so if you've read an article, when you step into their shoes, you are going to provoke empathy. Um, Harvard has that research. So if I'm gonna be the person driving the bike, then I'm gonna step into the shoes and I'm gonna say where we're going and who's going with me and what I'm doing and how I feel. And um, it's not gonna be, I feel nervous. I wouldn't do, do that if I felt nervous, excuse me. But you're stepping inside and you're able to use that first person language and describe it from that perspective. It's less judgmental when you do that. So another artful thinking strategy. One of the nice things about re-recording this is that at any point you could stop and say, that's enough for today. I'm already on information overload. I have three strategies. I might wanna try some of them out but I get to just keep on going and know that you can do that. So I'm gonna use my reasoning skills here. It's very similar to see, think, wonder. The only difference is, is that when I say it, I have to have evidence for it. In see, think, wonder, I don't have to have evidence. I'm just exploring it. So here I am going to be thinking about well, what is making me say that this is a happy image? Um, because it has bright colors, the color yellow, and I think I see a flower, and flowers are usually associated uh, with good things. So they build those explanations. They provide evidence for what they're going to say. And then question number three, what more can you find, is actually um, a research-based question and instead of saying, what else can you find, which implies you haven't found the right answer, what more can you find just invites more language, more thinking. One way to make an image like this a little bit more interesting though, is to quadrant it, put um, squares over it, reveal only pieces at a time. It allows you to let them say what they can, but it also lets you bring in new vocabulary, maybe laundry on a clothesline is new vocabulary. And you want to, you know, give that language. Did you notice? And then you say what it is. And then you just continue to unveil quadrants. And now you might say what's going on. And they're saying, oh, um, it's in a poor section of town. It's a painting. What makes you say that? What is your evidence that it's a poor section of town? So you can't get away with saying something unless you have evidence for it. And then you have a little bit more revealed and a little bit more revealed and a little bit more revealed. And the nice thing about this is that class might end here because you're gonna hold back on the most significant pieces because there's some curiosity going on. So like predict, what is this? Predict who's here, you know, think about this one at a time. Um, why did that boy stop to look at it? What is he thinking? And one of the things that we can do as a strategy is let's write a headline or a title 
that would capture this. Obviously, this is a work of art. It has a title. You know the title, but you can invite your students to write a title first, or if this had been a picture in a newspaper, write a headline, or if they're um, more skilled and they have more language, you could provide the headline or the title and then ask them to write the explanation or the first paragraph of the article that is in the paper. The advantage of that is you have that so they can see what they write and then they're comparing it to what is actually written. And that's a way for learners to acquire new relevant language. And so don't, I guess my message here would be hesitate to pass out the reading and the visual at the same time, because you can always do more if you separate them and use them in different ways. Um, and then I added in a more elementary example, again, um, for those of you that were teaching younger learners, but it could be as simple as we're in the middle of a unit on animals and we're talking about animal habitats and where they live. And so now you're starting to think about ocean or forest or city, uh, big animal, small animal, um, scales or fur, um, claws or paws. Um, what are you, why are you saying that it's the forest? Because I see green. And again, don't show the most important part in the same class period if you really want to increase curiosity. So we have this adorable little sloth and we can describe it and we talk about where he lives and then we'll read the amount of text that I've pulled on sloths for them to read. All of these were centered around tasks, writing a headline, writing a first paragraph, deciding whether what is happening or deciding what happened, what is happening, what is going to happen, writing those curiosity questions. These are all tasks. And so what we're doing is we're giving students something to do that's meaningful and purposeful, either to build understanding or to express meaning. So input or output, but it's not, there is a right answer. So it's not like, here's a question, come up with the answer. That's not what we want. We want students thinking purposefully and generating language with a specific task in mind. And as we develop those tasks, we're going to notice they really did not expressly ask for language practice. Nothing said, write this in the past tense. It said, what happened? So we're thinking through how do we practice the language we need to practice in erogatives, but we're not saying or creating a language drill to practice in erogatives. I do have to guide them and those thinking questions, what do you see, what do you think, what do you wonder, or write a headline, write the first paragraph. They're structured, I told them what to do, so they've got guidance. And then they could progress from very beginning of the unit, simple, just write a couple of sentences, to a more complex answer to a question or description of an image by the end of a unit. So for example, in the sixth grade textbook, the first unit is all about identity. Who are you? Who am I? Who am I? Who are you? And so initially, I might only be writing a few simple things about who I am and what I like to do. But as we move through that unit, I'm adding details about, you know, the foods I eat with my family, the what I wear for different celebrations um, to a final passage on what will the future bring? What are my future hopes and aspirations? So I can keep adding to the task over the course of the unit. So here's where we hit our first pause point, and I wanna do a better job of explaining it. So we've gone through six strategies, and if you've downloaded the guide, you have the six and you have the explanations. And so, you know, pausing here to think about, I'm preparing my lessons for next Saturday, 
what might I do in the near future? What, what could I do? Do I want to do this one on see, think, wonder? Do I have to go find an image? And then a chance if you're doing this with others to look at these two images and think about, well, do these connect to the sixth grade curriculum or not? And if yes, how? And then what would I do with these images? Why am I picking these images? And so it, it's a great point to stop and talk. And what would I do with them in class? But you could pause here and do that. But let's let I'm going to give you some suggestions right now. So if you intended to have a discussion, you need to stop and do it before you listen any further. So obviously, see, think, wonder, you know, where are they? What are they doing? How are they feeling? Or step inside, you know, I'm that woman in the middle. What am I thinking? What am I feeling? Why? Who am I with? What's going on? Well, this is a current event picture about the celebration for the space uh, event. And so when I add that picture in, I covered it up like I did with the other one, that will help them bring meaning to the picture. What are they celebrating? Why are they celebrating? Well, this might not have any connection to your curriculum at all. It's a major current event in the target culture. So you want to bring it into your class and talk about it. Sometimes we get too hung up on what our textbooks say we're doing and we forget that language is culture in motion. It's about the real world. And so when significant events happen in the real world, they need to come into our classroom to be acknowledged and discussed and talked about, read about, you know, whatever is appropriate for the level you teach. But don't ignore a significant current event, um, either that's cultural or that's just impacting their lives. The other image is a bit sillier, but pets are a part of our world. And so, you know, what are you seeing here? Who is this cat? Um, describe the cat. Uh, where is the cat? Where does the cat live? Does the cat have an owner? Ask questions. Be curious. Um, show a second image because this showed up, I think, in an Instagram account from Turkey. Um, now, what's similar? What's different? Um, why is the cat real and alive in the first picture and a statue in the second picture? And then you've got that headline to read about a cat who used to live on the street and was always sitting there. And then when he died, the people missed him and they built the statue. And what statues do we have? And why do we have statues? And Or it's just a simple comparison picture. What's similar and what's different? Count the number of cars. Notice the table and chairs. Notice that stores are closed and stores are open. You bring to any image the language and purpose that you want, but use those images to spark that curiosity. So basically there are more strategies than six that you could use. So you can go back to, um, Harvard's visible thinking page, and you can find others. But these are a good six to start with. And then on that document page that I created, you have a brief explanation. So the next time you're planning a lesson, you've got a reading in your textbook, you're going to think, now, what image or video could I find that would open this and make it more thought provoking than perhaps the text? How can I add in? Um, significant impact in their brain, trigger that dopamine, and then make them want to read what's in the textbook. We took a stretch break here, and I decided to leave this slide in because I think if you're still just listening, you have listened for long enough, you have enough content to work with for a while, and it would be better to pause here make some meaningful applications, talk with others about what you're doing, what's working, what's not working. But we're gonna go into the second part of this, which is going to first be about differentiation and then uh, a few more examples of visuals pulling it all together. So I was specifically asked to talk about this idea that within a class, a group of 20 to 30 students, 
that not all students are in the same point. Not all students have the same motivational level um, as their peers and that that is normal. So if you walk into a sixth grade class, an English language arts teacher will tell you that she has sixth graders reading at the kindergarten level and sixth graders reading at the 12th grade level. And so what's important is knowing the learning goal. What is it that you want each learner to be able to do and getting them there? So earlier it was like, I can talk about the benefits of animals or I can describe a refugee experience or I can say, I can explain what my family eats for a special occasion or I can describe my wishes for the future. Those are your goals. It's never, I can read, I can write, I can listen, I can speak, I can understand. Those are the skills you use to meet the learning goal. So it's very strong, purposeful words like explain, describe, compare, analyze, indicate. They have to do something to demonstrate either that they understand or that they can produce. And so it's thinking about, well, student B just doesn't really need any extra help at all. They're just going to get there. The lessons I plan will work for him. But student A and student C, I'm going to have to be thoughtful about what I need to add so that they can do it. And basically scaffolding, it's temporary. So the idea is that you keep doing it only until they're in that midpoint, that student B that's just marching right there. So scaffolding is temporary, right? First, we start with a tricycle. We're not gonna stay on a tricycle. And then we're gonna do training wheels. And then we're gonna be in an independent rider. And then we're just gonna be on a bigger bike with more independence and maybe a little bit of foolishness because we took the helmet off. But it's that idea that if we scaffold, we can get them all there. And so having a specific goal in mind is step one for differentiation or scaffolding. So this idea of differentiation is not necessarily that everybody has to climb the same tree. That is not reasonable. And it's not creating separate lessons for students like, here, gifted, you get this lesson, or here, you're challenged, so you do this, or thinking, well, they are really smart and they can't do it. It's not offering a choice, like here's 10 questions, answer five, because then they pick the five easiest ones. It's having a real clear mindset that our students can all meet our learning goal if we vary the conditions under which they do it. And so obviously this is a very busy slide and it's one that you'll wanna come back and read with more detail if this is an area of focus for you. But basically in differentiation, we can change the content, the process or the product. Well, the content is somewhat packed for you by the textbook. So you're not really going to change the actual textbook. A sixth grader is going to get the sixth grade content. But what you can do is add to that content the support they might need. Maybe they need an additional reading, or maybe they can't just read the text, but they need images to help make it more comprehensible. Maybe we should watch a video before we read the text because that will be build some visual awareness. Maybe I need to do some vocabulary work or give word banks for some tasks, but the goal is still the same. It's just that the idea that you read and that's your goal and it's done, student B, doesn't work for some that are on other paths. We can change the process of how they work in the classroom alone, in pairs, small groups, whether we need to provide some help sessions, uh, some tutoring, letting stronger students work with weaker students, letting older students work with younger students, 
do I need to model how I figured out what that word meant by doing a read aloud, think aloud? Can I give someone more time or less time? And then in terms of product, um, do they all have to show the same product to prove that they learned it? Or do they all get the same amount of time? Maybe someone needs one week and someone needs two weeks. Or maybe someone wants to produce a PowerPoint and do a speaking and somebody else wants to write out an explanation. But as long as they demonstrate that they can explain how animals, how people, or the story of a refugee, can I give them some choice in what they do to explain that? And so those are the ideas of differentiation, a goal for everyone and support so that they all get there by varying content process product. Easy, easy ones to implement. And if you implement these, everyone in the classroom will learn better. So the first one is the idea of think, write, pair, share. So I'm, I might be quick to say, turn to your partner and, or work with your group and, but what I've forgotten then is I haven't given them any time for that individual accountability piece. So if I throw a question out there about my content, perhaps every student should think about the answer. So I used to say in my class, um, okay, think about the answer. When you have an answer, put your hand on your head. And that was good because any student that put their hand on their head, I could walk over and they could whisper their answer to me. So there was individual accountability for thinking. I could also say, not just think, I don't trust you to think because you might be thinking about baseball or what you're doing that night. Everybody write their individual answer. And when that's done, now turn to your partner and share that answer. See if you agree, see if you can change it, make it better. And then I will call on a non-volunteer to share the answer, a couple of non-volunteers. So we're slowing the pace down but we're guaranteeing learning for all. Numbered heads together is an extension of that. So you may have done think, write, pair, share, and then put them in groups to discuss. But then within that group, every student has a number, one, two, three, four. And so let's say that I've asked them to be ready to describe a family meal that is important to them. And they've all been sharing that. They've been talking about that family meal. And then I take cards that are numbered one, two, three, four, and I draw number three. Number three, you will be speaking for your group. And what that does is it says, hey, everybody better be ready. So you're not calling on a volunteer from the group because that will be the strongest student. You also could turn that into a writing activity, which if your students are struggling, someone said during the presentation, you know, what writing is their weakest skill? Well, then I wouldn't let them demonstrate understanding by speaking. I would have every student in the group write the same answer, and I would collect the paper for number three, read that one, and give feedback to the group that way. So how you report out from the group depends on the skill that you most need to work on. You heard me say twice, perhaps, during those last two, that you must have a system for calling on non-volunteers. So in the book, Focus um, by Schmoker, the, uh, the uh, research is there, but the worst thing we can do as teachers is call on volunteers. What we want to do instead is do the think, write, pair, share, do the numbered heads together, give them that chance to turn and talk. And then when everyone should be prepared, they could have called you over for help. You call on a non-volunteer using a random system. So names on an index card, popsicle sticks like kindergarten teachers use, call on a couple of non-volunteers, and then if you wanna open it to volunteers, that's fine. But it's very important that you get a sense of 
the fact that everyone is comfortable answering and not just the best students in the class, or in some places, the volunteers are the class clowns. The product, as long as it's open-ended and it's a task. So to the best of our abilities, we do not want to give tasks that have right and wrong answers because then we're allowing a student to do as much as they can. And when they do that, they're showing us where they are in terms of proficiency. So if you look at, well, this is a novice low and this is a novice mid and this is a novice high, then you're thinking about where is this student and what comes next? It's an entirely different perspective than saying you got it right, you got it wrong. So you did what you did, you did the best you could, and here's what comes next for you. And so when we're thinking about sixth grade, we're right in that intermediate low where we really want them to create simple sentences. And then if they're doing that, we wanna be pushing them towards paragraphs. You know, those sentences that hang together really well. So it's no longer, I like ice cream, I like football, I like soccer. It's, I like ice cream and I really like it when we go to this place and I almost always get, and that's my favorite ice cream. Or it's like multiple sentences about that sport that they like and they start to take risks and they the sentences are more creative. And the interesting thing is that when they start doing that, they make more mistakes. And so mistakes are things to be celebrated in terms of increasing proficiency. And then finally, by the time they get to intermediate high, they're doing those paragraphs in the various time frames. And it's important to think about seal of biliteracy varies by state, but in most states it's intermediate high. There are a few that it's intermediate mid. Um, so you're thinking about getting them solidly into this range by the time they want to take that seal of biliteracy exam, sorry. And then the same thing happens with the types of questions they're asking. Often we forget that we have to practice that interpersonal skill of asking questions. And again, here, it's just like I was talking about in the last one, asking that appropriate follow-up question if you tell me you like ice cream, I say, what kind or where do you like to go? I don't say, do you like football? I've got to keep it on topic. And so I also need to build my repertoire of questions. And then finally, I get up here where I can manipulate you by the questions that I ask. So let's look at a sample of this. So my goal is that you can explain um, the role that food plays in your lives. And then here are the steps of the task. Describe your typical eating habits. Think about healthy and unhealthy. And then let's do some comparison to the target culture. So here's one that you know I made up, similar to one I read actually, um, took a couple of liberties with it. But when I at school, I don't eat breakfast. I eat lunch at school, sometime pizza and salad. I also eat hamburgers and fries and drink soda. Lunch is not healthy. After school, I like coffee and cake or cookies. I dinner at home. We cook fish and vegetables often. I have fruit in night. I healthy, but maybe I want more fruits and vegetables, not desserts. I like French breakfast. Bread and jelly is good with coffee and milk. The school lunch is healthy and more time than at my school. Dinner is not a big meal like for me. The French like ice cream and I too like ice cream too. The first thing you're gonna do is you are going to think about where does this fall on a proficiency rating? And so you tend to wanna look at reasons for mistakes that drive you crazy but what is the proficiency level? And you might wanna flip back to the previous screen to think about that for a moment. So what you're seeing here then is that you basically have sentences, but there are a few 
where they're not sentences. And so you would say that this is novice high, simple sentences most of the time. And although we tend to think of the number of mistakes a student makes as an indicator of how good they are, in, in terms of proficiency, and when you're thinking about doing well on a seal of biliteracy, it is about the quality of the sentences they write and whether what they write is comprehensible. This is comprehensible. There are spelling mistakes, there are mistakes with verbs. The other thing that's really good about this, and it's important to notice this before we look at the mistakes, is that this person looked at the task and completed it. So they had the vocabulary that they needed to do the writing and meet the four conditions. They described the day of eating, they named meals, some foods, they talked about healthy, unhealthy, and they did some comparison of cultural habits. So overall, as an educator, I have to be pretty happy with this. But then there's that piece that says, but are there mistakes? Yes. And so you really wanna think about and which of these mistakes are the most important. So I can ignore some mistakes, but in order to get them to intermediate low, which is the goal, what's that next proficiency rating? Then I gotta work on the, the ones that are not sentences. When I at school, I don't eat breakfast needs a verb in order to be a sentence. I eat lunch at school is a mistake but it's not a major mistake. It's still a sentence. Sometime pizza and salad needs a verb. That means it's not a sentence. I dinner at home, they didn't conjugate the verb. That's not a sentence. So I wanna work on those errors that kept them from being creating sentences and moving into intermediate low. I want them to take that I too like ice cream and remember that they need to conjugate that verb. And so that would be the types of mistakes that I would be working on. So you would pause here and you would think, okay, I'm gonna be teaching a class. What must be in place so that I can think about those extra supports? And so what is your learning goal for your next class? What, what I can, what will every student be expected to do um, as a result of the reading and the things that you do? And then how are you making it possible to meet those lesson and unit goals? So are you giving that open-ended writing? So it's not right and it's not wrong, but I can see where they are and then I can take action to move them forward in terms of their own skills. So another slide where it's good to pause and think about what am I doing? What additional supports could I provide? So as we move into that third segment, we really are focused on our communication standards. We want our students to be able to listen. We want them to be able to read and understand. We want them to be able to talk with other people in a spontaneous manner. So an unrehearsed negotiation of meaning um, using appropriate uh, register, the, the right uh, way to approach different people. And then presentational, we wanna focus primarily on their ability to write on demand, like in front of you, in class, without access to resources, what can they produce? And then we wanna move them forward from that because that's the type of writing that they will do on assessments for the seal of biliteracy. And so snippets of writing, pick them up, create systems for giving feedback to the class, critically important. Ideally, when you put a class together for an hour or a two hour class, you will be in and out of all three modes of communication within that class period. Keep in mind, the only learning time you control is the time they are with you. So you really can't expect, this was one of the questions that came up, a lot of growth or development through homework or through support at home. 
So you have to use the instructional minutes that you have available to you. And then you have to hope that they will want to do more on their own. And, you know, they are just like all students everywhere. Homework is tricky these days. So basically, in order for a student to produce good language, either in the interpersonal or presentational mode, they have to be exposed to quality language through what they read, through what they hear. So we're always going to start with input on a topic. Keep in mind, a visual is a source of input. A video is a source of input. And then once they processed it in the interpretive mode and they understand it, we're always going to connect tasks so that they're talking about it or they're writing about it. And those are the tasks that we talked about earlier from Bill Van Patten. Expression and interpretation of meaning, not language practice. Don't spend a great deal of time on is it right or is it wrong. Spend a great, all your time as much as possible on real world applications, telling, explaining those types of um, functions. So in the interpretive process, when we're going to pick up a text or a video, it's always, what do we do before we start that text? Um, we discuss it, we predict it, we ask questions, we brainstorm. Some of those thinking routines allowed for that. What makes you say that? What do you think is going to happen? And so you're thinking through, well, why do I want to read this even? How do I get them interested in reading or watching this? Then it's time to read or it's time to watch. So that's going to be very focused. And that is individual work. And maybe one of the biggest mistakes we make is when we assign reading, we read with partners. And if you read with a partner, the better reader does the work and the weaker reader coast. It's also silent. Reading aloud is not helpful when you're trying to process meaning. And so after, oops, I think I want to go back and clarify what I just said. If anyone is reading aloud, it is the teacher who is reading aloud and the students are lit reading along and listening because the teacher knows the correct pronunciation, where to place emphasis, those types of things. So it's the students who do not read aloud. And then finally, after reading, what, why did we read that text? What are we going to get out of it? What was the purpose of reading it? And this is where sometimes we'll have a text and we'll be thinking, I can't figure out the purpose of this text. Well, you can't do everything. Even though you have a great textbook, you can't do a lesson a week. So you are gonna be making some choices based on your learners and what they need. And so, Find the readings that you think will appeal to them most and do more with them and let a couple others go in order to really be able to extend that um, reading to something that's relevant. <clears throat> so let's look at this in the context of this video, which is very short. It's in Spanish. I'm going to let you listen to it and see it, and then we're going to talk about it um, in just a moment. Hello. Un día feliz puede iniciar con un desayuno completo. Puedes disfrutarlo combinando pan bimbo, huevo y verduras. A tu desayuno, échale bimbo. So I think when I timed that video, it was 20 minutes. But I, as a teacher, am going to make that last far longer than that. So what am I gonna do? First, I'm doing what I said. I have to know my goal. I can describe a healthy breakfast. I need to understand exactly what I want learners to be able to do because they've watched this video. And so I share that goal with them in English and I make sure that they understand what the expectation is. So keeping in mind the before, during, and after, before I even show the video, I might show some images of breakfast from around the world 
or just some images of breakfast from Tamil culture. I connect food items um, to their place on the food pyramid. So we start to think about, well, this breakfast of pastries. Mm. And then I ask them to talk about what do they like and what don't they like and what do they eat for breakfast and what do they never eat for breakfast. And I know that we're leading now into um, the video. And so remember, it was a song and then I'm Mr. Lonely, a song that no one would recognize at the age of your students. So I'm just going to play part one. And by part one, if you want to uh, put that back in your brain, or you can go watch it, I put the YouTube link on the screen, is when the up to when the bread arrives. So the students do not see the bread flying in. And I'm going to show screenshots one at a time. And so before they see it, even we're going to be thinking about what can you say? Do you know the word for eggs? Do you know the word for peppers? Do you know the word for berries? Um, and work with all three breakfasts and then talk about which one they prefer and why they prefer that one. And then are they healthy? And then we can read the caption and we can name the emotion associated with all of these breakfasts. So if you're thinking about it, you're seeing the frowning face made with pickles and peppers and avocado. And so why are these breakfasts sad? And this time I'm gonna play the sound and they'll hear the song and they'll hear the word lonely and they'll learn that word in meal. And then we predict why those breakfasts are lonely. And then I'm gonna move on and I'm gonna be preparing them for the second part of the video. So now I'm gonna show a picture of a happy breakfast and a picture of a sad breakfast. And I'm gonna ask them to see the difference. Do you notice it? I'm not gonna call attention to it. I'll play the entire video now. And now they can clearly identify the change. Um, they write it down themselves because we're gonna do think, write, pair, share. Then they share that with their partner. And then I call on a non-volunteer to share with the class. And then there's that final part of the video where we can analyze the breakfast and say, you know, does this breakfast have fruit? What is the fruit? What is the vegetable? Is there protein? And however much we wanna do with that. So I'm gonna be working then with the key food category words and then the individual food vocabulary words. There was a little bit of Spanish in this video, not much. And so I can then, if I wanna really look at that vocabulary, I can give them a, a close reading activity where I've removed words that they should be able to fill in by meaning, not because it was a certain grammar verb, a grammar point, but just by knowing what the message is, they should be able to make a reasonable guess as to what goes in that blank. And so they work individually, very important to work individually. Then if you want, they could compare with their partner or what you might wanna do is play it again so they can fill in more. Or you might wanna give them a word bank so that they can fill in more and then they compare with their partner and then they listen again. And then, you know, you're going to continue to extend that to where maybe they take a picture of their breakfast and they describe it and they say whether it's healthy or unhealthy, because you have to move into that after and meet that goal. So where are you going with it? Or they pair with other students in the class and they talk about what they eat, what they don't eat, whether it's healthy or unhealthy. So let's look at one more example. Um, a couple more examples. This was um, an article that had this image with it, as well as text. And so we might do what I did earlier with the street art where you're covering up pieces. What do you see? What do you think? What do you wonder? What evidence do you have for that? But in this case, I'm going to give them the reading, which you probably can understand a lot of that French just based on the fact that you speak more than one language and it's got a lot of numbers in it, but you can see the evidence of culture in a, in a simple short reading, you know, the kilometers, the way the numbers are written. 
And so um, Daniel is nine years old. He lives in the Philippines. It's a country in Southeast Asia. It's about 11,000 kilometers from France. And the Philippines are made up of 7,000 islands. And Daniel lives in Cebu, which is uh, an island located in the center of the Philippines. And so what I'm going to do is say, okay, read silently, individually, and as you read, write as many questions as you can that are answered in the text. This is so much better than you making up any type of worksheet or questions to go with the reading. So they should be able to write, what is his name? Where does he live? How old is he? Where is Cebu? How many islands are in the Philippines? Then once they've had you know a certain amount of time to write as many questions as they can, then you're going to say, now pair with your partner and ask and answer each other's questions. You're walking around, you're listening. You might add a question in that you didn't hear. Now call on a non-volunteer to ask a question and another non-volunteer in the class to answer that question and go back and forth rotate it, go back and forth. And so then you can chime in with your questions at the end. What have you done? You have made them, you know, analyze the picture before. You've given them a activity while they did silent reading. And then you've extended that by asking and answering questions in the classroom. So then you might wanna move this into a presentational writing task where you're really working on bumping up their proficiency level. Someone during the session shared that, you know, their students are very good at the speaking and the listening, but writing is weak. Well, when that happens, you have to take your class time and shift more of it to writing, Just trying to get them even in their terms of their skills. So instead of having the students write five sentences that are very short and simple, you might write five sentences, four or five sentences. And the task is first work individually and see if you can take these five sentences, these five ideas and combine them into one sentence that has the same ideas. I highly suggest that you pause here and you try it. So write down a sentence, one sentence that pulls all of these ideas together. The other thing about writing with students this way in class is it's almost a game. It's a challenge. They can share their sentences with each other and they can improve the sentence between the two of them. And then you would call on them or share some sentences. And they can see that if they were, were to use that relative pronoun who, they've got a much better sentence. So we've moved from the novice mid high and into intermediate low. And your students need to understand that that's what they're working on. Because if you just say write sentences, that's compliance. But when you start to think about what type of sentences and how to make them better, that's coaching to make them better at the skill of writing. It's just like a coach having a student practice free throws. In the interpersonal mode, we're gonna use that step inside technique because we read about Danielle, we know a little bit about him. So we're gonna step inside, we're gonna speak in the first person as if we're Danielle, and then the other student is gonna be the student and we're gonna have a conversation and they're gonna get acquainted. So it's gonna be, what is your name and how old are you? And where do you live and what do you like? And um, why are you studying at night? And those types of things. One time through is not gonna do it. So then they can switch roles and do it again but then in that next class period, they should switch partners and do it again. So we always want to make sure that between one class and the next class, there's carryover because it's that recycling that's so impactful for learning. So you might walk in, show the picture, write as much as you remember about Danielle. And now we get together and we have a conversation where we step inside his shoes and we talk to other people. So always take even the simplest text and milk it for all it's worth. And you do that by thinking, what can I do before? 
What can I do during? What can I do after? Whether it's a text, a video, even just a picture. How do I actually build that buzz, engage them during, and then recycle, remind, relive? And keep in mind that while you're doing before, during, after, you'll be actively using the interpretive mode, the interpersonal mode, and the presentational mode, definitely with a focus on writing, not presentational speaking. A couple of questions came up, how do I prepare them for the test? So I've given you a couple during the presentation, but you also wanna keep in mind that you are always working on improving their writing, their accuracy in terms of language. So if they were to watch this particular video, which I am gonna mute because we don't need to hear the Spanish or the French, but sometimes you find a really good video and you, um, and you can take the sound off and the images are still really worthwhile. And you can talk about and describe and predict where are they going, what are they doing? And all of a sudden you start to build the theme of this video, what is it about? Uh, which questions do you think are being answered? And now you really get the absolute answer that this is about going to school. And so when you're working with a video, it could be that you're also thinking about how do I use the images in this particular video in order to make sure they understand? So first is always check for comprehension. Um, this picture has um, more than one student and they are very happy about going to school. And the only one that really conveys emotion has more than one is three. So they might signal three. And then you describe a few more. And then you're thinking about, well, what grammar can I pull out of this? What do I need to introduce? Or what do I need to recycle because they're making mistakes? Me and they're still struggling with conjugating that verb to go. So how do they go to school? How does he go to school? She go to school? How do you go to school? And we're going to be working with a verb that causes problems in French, it does anyway. And then I might even work with a regular verb because that came up over and over again in the French. They cross this, they cross a minefield, they cross a river, they cross frozen ice to go to school. And so we can work with those. So I am always looking for the opportunity to work on grammar that they are struggling with from the texts I am doing. So it's a different approach than saying, it's time to work on the past tense. That's fine, it's time to work on the past tense, but then where do I keep bringing that past tense back? Because you don't get anything the first time. And so it could be that in this particular video, I wanna go back and work with prepositions, talk about the different countries they heard, or I wanna work with interrogatives, write some questions, and then answer them, students write questions, or maybe I'd like to introduce a more sophisticated language pattern. I would or I would not change places with this student because, or maybe I just wanna add in some more sophisticated vocabulary. Yeah, I think they know it's hot and cold and sunny, but they might not know dusty. So let's bring in a new um, vocabulary description about weather or you, anything that you think they need additional practice on. And it's impossible for a textbook to do that for you. You have to see your students, you have to know your students, you have to know where they are in order to think. And that's why it's called pop up grammar, pop up, because you see it and you do the need. Two things that I added in, I added this one in very quickly when we were together on that Saturday but um, it's called a scripted conversation. And this is what it's gonna be like. So I want you to talk as if you're Danielle and that other student, and I want you to talk for 30 seconds. And if you run out of things to say, I want you to start over, I'm gonna have you record it, and then you're gonna stop, and then you're gonna replay your recording, and each of you is gonna transcribe it. So you both write out exactly what you said, not just your lines, but your partner's lines also. 
And then you want a feedback loop. So they might consult their notes to see what else they could have said. They might um, exchange with a part, other partners and the other partners might suggest things they could have said or they read each other's. And basically they're jotting down ideas for improving the conversation. Other questions they could have asked, other vocabulary they could have used. Then you call time, they put all of that away and they do the conversation again. They don't read anything. They don't look at that script. They just read it again. They look at it. They listen again. They might score it using a rubric. And then they turn, change partners and they do it again. And the idea is that you can always improve. So how do we practice this improvement cycle in class when they're with us? Because we're pushing them up the proficiency. And then another way to do it is to do triads. And triads basically, um, it, it's kind of the same thing, but they don't have to script it. So student one and student two talk. Student three is the note taker, the monitor. So after I listen to student one and two as student three, I give them feedback. Or I say, you could have asked. And then student two and three talk and student one gives feedback. And then student three and one talk and student two gives feedback. And then we can jumble the groups and do it again if they still need additional practice. And this is the idea, here's my goal. They are going to be able to step into the shoes of Danielle and have a, a getting acquainted conversation and a conversation about school. And all of them are gonna do this. Some are gonna be stronger, some are gonna be weaker, but by doing it again, changing the dynamics, and building in a feedback loop, I've got that student A, student B, student C with some scaffolding that they may need. The same thing happens in writing. This was not in the original um, presentation, but it was a question and I said I would add them back drafting. When the student turns in some sentences, just sort of like the ones about Danielle, how they were short and sweet and we rewrote them, it's the same idea, but this time it's their own writing and so that's great. Now rewrite again, fewer sentences, more words. I want you to expand this and give me something that's a little bit more interesting. So that's very similar to what we did before. When we start to get into the intermediate low, intermediate mid, we might change that. So now they've written something individually and I'm a big proponent of them writing in class. And then they give that to another student who reads it and is very curious. And so it's like, tell that student to ask questions. Then when you give the writing back, they, the original writer has to answer the questions as they rewrite the text. And so what you have, like what kind of restaurants does your family like? Well, now I've got to add in some details like my family really enjoys going to. And then what do you usually order or avoid for the main course? And then finally, what kind of chocolate desserts do you like? So all of a sudden, instead of 41 words, I'm probably going to rewrite it with more information. That's why it's fat drafting. And it'll be a more interesting um, paragraph to read. And keep in mind, there may be mistakes, spelling and grammar, but when you're talking about proficiency and doing well on external assessments, the seal of biliteracy, you're talking more about types of sentences than you are about mistakes. The only thing we really worry about is if the mistakes are patterns of errors. So hopefully this has given you some ideas of things that you can do in your classes. And I think it's the Albert Einstein quote that probably gives me some peace of mind because teaching is an incredibly complex task. And so the truth of the matter is you can never teach your pupils. So I have spent a, a bit of time talking and I've been trying to teach you. I do not control your brains. So all I can do is attempt to provide conditions in which you can learn. So, you know, I've put images to go with the words that I'm saying. I put pause points in for you to discuss and apply. I provided the note-taking tool. I can only do things like that. 
you know, my goals were stated at the beginning about using visuals, using visuals to enhance engagement, using visuals to work with language in the three modes. Hopefully the conditions that I did that, under which I did that have allowed you to acquire and learn some of that. But that's what we control. We cannot control the actual learning, uh, our student learning the material. So thank you very much. And um, you know how this is my email should you have questions. And I hope that we have the opportunity to work together again. Um, have a great day.